had a really interesting, oh, the announcement is being recorded. All right, great. So uh, yeah, we're really excited to welcome Barry Markovsky. Um, it's not typical for us to have a professor of sociology um, with us today. So this is gonna be a really interesting talk and hopefully you guys have all read the description of it and I can't wait to hear about it. Um, he's Barry is a professor of sociology at University of South Carolina. Um, he's got a lot of great publications out there and uh, I guess he would be drawing on some of his work from 2001 on the social influence of paranormal beliefs. Um, this is all really cool, interesting, relevant stuff. Um, and I can't wait to hear what he has to say in more detail. So I'll give you the floor, Barry. Okay, just, just one other thing, yeah. yeah. Uh, if, if you have questions, we're gonna save them to the end, write them in the yeah. chat or you know, write them down and we can unmute yourself at the end to ask the questions, but uh, yeah. Thanks, Stephen. All right, take it away, Barry, thanks so much. All right, well, I'm uh, gonna be trying to share my screen here in just a second. So uh, I'll just introduce the talk by reminding you of the title. It's called Healthy Skepticism, Thinking Critically About Astonishing Claims. And it's gonna be about being... Oh, sorry, Barry, I just muted you by accident. Go ahead and unmute yourself, I apologize. That's okay. Uh, about being skeptical in a way that roots out false claims, but uh, doesn't prematurely dismiss true claims. And I'll also talk a bit about why we believe false claims and then uh, also try to provide some, some rather color, colorful illustrations. So let me see if I can uh, get my screen shared properly here. Trying to get the show running. Yeah. Uh, worked before. All right. Looks good, Barry. So uh, I wanted to start with a fun fact that uh, the word bunkum, well, skeptics like to debunk bunkum. And I don't know if any of you guys know this, but uh, it was named after Buncombe County in North Carolina. Uh, our very own county, and I'm happy to say that our current uh, representative in Congress is spewing plenty of bunkum and keeping that tradition alive. So thanks, uh, Madison Cawthorn. And the plan today, uh, it was really hard for me to narrow down topics for the presentation. Uh, I have way too, way too much material, but uh, here's where I landed. A few years ago, I briefly dated a doctor of naturopathic medicine. She claimed it's all very scientific. I was skeptical, uh, more on that shortly. We're gonna take a brief look at some of the limitations of human judgment and how those limitations contribute to false beliefs. And finally, I'm gonna weigh in on some spooky videos from a South Carolina vape shop. So we'll st we'll st I guess Carol King's song was in my head when I was working on part one, uh, the naturopathic doctor. We're gonna call her Jane. I met her at a dating site, actually. We got off to a nice start, but um, she was a doctor of naturopathic medicine. And at the time I only knew two things about that. One is the dictionary definition that uh, mentions a lot, of, uh, a, a lot of red flag words for me. And the other is that mainstream science and medicine don't hold naturopathic medicine in very high regard, to put it mildly. Uh, I'm gonna use Patrick Stewart for my avatar because of the uncanny resemblance, as I've been told um, by the voices in my head. And uh, to be skeptical means suspending assent or acceptance if definitive evidence is lacking. So that's different from rejecting a claim entirely. And also if an astonishing claim would overturn centuries of accumulated scientific knowledge, obviously we, we want more than just anecdotal evidence for that. And I mentioned 
in this uh, definition, I mentioned theory very deliberately. In science, a theory isn't a mere guess. It's a deeply supported explanation that, uh, among other things, is consistent with evidence and not inconsistent with other well-grounded theories. So yes, we want good evidence for a given claim, but even if the evidence seems pretty good, without a deeper theoretical understanding of how something works, it's healthy and it's fair to still regard it with some skepticism. Now, regarding naturopathy, uh, there, there, these are the sorts of things that are written about naturopathy by qualified critics. And I mean, people who know medicine, who've studied the field of naturopathy. They say it's, uh, it has inconsistent methods and diagnoses, that magical thinking is baked into the system, that it, uh, there's apparently only a weak grasp of basic science, and they reject science-based medical practices. So this obviously was biasing me to begin with. Now, I'm gonna bring in uh, a little bit of social psychology here because I'm also very interested in why we believe things. Uh, for the sake of the potential relationship with Jane, I was actually motivated to try to see the good in naturopathy, despite my predisposition, which was pretty negative. And as I said, we both started off uh, regarding each other fairly positively. And there's a theory in social psychology to help explain why I might have become a believer in naturopathic medicine. This is called balance theory, and it predicts attitude changes based on relationships between elements in a social situation. Now, this is a very simple case. We have two people and one object, the two people started off liking each other. She certainly likes naturopathic medicine, but I had this negative predisposition to start out. Now, given that Jane likes naturopathic medicine and my predisposition was negative, that creates what the theory calls an unbalanced three cycle. So you can kind of draw a line from Jane to naturopathic medicine to me back to Jane the direction of the arrows doesn't matter. And you see that we have a three cycle with one negative sign. And the theory predicts that this will be an imbalanced cycle due to the odd number of negative signs. And if there is an unbalanced cycle, the prediction is that the situation will be altered toward a balanced situation. So something's gonna change in that situation. The obvious alteration, or maybe the, the most straightforward one, would be for me to change my attitude to positive. So I looked into this more than I certainly would have otherwise. I tried. I asked Jane for the best scientific evidence that she knew of for any treatment that she uh, prescribes as a naturopathic physician, and she chose homeopathy. And she gave me this article which she said she found very convincing. Now, a little bit about homeopathy, and you'll see why I was initially skeptical about this. It was uh, started by a single person, uh, Samuel Hardeman, Hard Hahnemann, back in 1790. He invented, I don't know what, word to use for this, but he invented a couple of completely evidence-free laws that he said would be at the heart of this system. Uh, it's certainly not a conventional system. He conducted what he called provings by testing substances on himself and making note of his reactions to them. Now, let me get to the laws here. The, the two central laws in the system are called like cures like and the law of infinitesimals. Applying the law of like cures like means that, for example, if he ingests some birch bark and it gives him a headache, well, that means that the cure for headaches is going to involve birch bark, small amounts of it. And the law of infinitesimals says that the smaller the amount of that active ingredient, the more powerful the treatment. You heard me right. Uh, it's counterintuitive. It's also counter 
physics and medicine and everything else. Uh, so here's the catch. The small amount that we're talking about uh, is actually a dilution of that active ingredient, but it's diluted so extremely in distilled water or in some solid medium like uh, cornstarch, it's diluted so extremely that there isn't a single molecule left of the original active ingredient. So the idea is that uh, the water or the cornstarch somehow remembers what was dissolved in it. And again, there's, there's no objective research on this. It contradicts physics and chemistry. There's no physiological theory about how it works. Now we know that placebo effect is probably accounting for just about any uh, observed effect. And <laughs> suggesting that it's all quackery, uh, magician and debunker James Randi uh, used to begin many of his talks by ingesting an entire bottle of homeopathic sleeping pills. So that should be a massive overdose, but they had no effect on him, of course. Uh, but then when you think about it, wouldn't taking a half a tablet be more powerful than taking a whole tablet or taking a full bottle, law of infinitesimals, right? Uh, you'd, uh, there's no logic to it. And if you try to investigate within the field of homeopathy, what's the deal with overdoses? You've, they're just all over the map. Some say you can't overdose at all. Some say it depends how quickly you take the substance. Some say it depends on how much of the substance you take. But again, the substance, the active ingredient really doesn't exist. Uh, here's an example of a product I just kind of picked at random. This is for flu-like symptoms. Harris, maybe you should have taken this. Uh, lactose, sucrose, those are the only ingredients listed because everything else has been diluted out of it. So it's a sugar pill. Okay, back to the article that Jane gave me. It, it began with just a scathing and mocking con condemnation of skeptics. Uh, anyone who's stupid enough to be skeptical of homeopathy was skewered in this article. And it began by claiming that virtually all epidemics were treated successfully with homeopathy, cholera, yellow fever, scarlet fever, typhoid, pneumonia, influenza. But of course, that's not clinical evidence, that's historical evidence. And I specifically asked for clinical evidence. You could also argue that historical evidence is not much better, if at all better, than anecdotal evidence. So I wanted to see supportive clinical studies, but this article, which is why Jane gave it to me, claims that there are over 150 supportive, peer-reviewed, placebo-controlled clinical studies. And as evidence of that claim, the author cited five, which I assumed must have been some of the most convincing uh, ones. Well, I went and read those. Here's the conclusion from the first one. There's a lack of conclusive evidence. Homeopathy should not be substituted for proven therapies. All right, well, here's the second one. There's insufficient evidence to conclude that homeopathy is clearly efficacious for any of the observed clinical conditions. So we struck out again. The third study. The evidence wasn't sufficient to draw definitive conclusions because of the low quality of the research. Again, the author of this review article is, is saying that these cited articles provide, in, uh, provide conclusive positive evidence for the efficacy of homeopathy. On to number four, well, that wasn't, it turns out, an article uh, with clinical evidence. It was the author's own book on sale for $90. No thanks. I looked at the table of contents and it just was a review um, and, a, and a history of the field and that sort of thing. There wasn't any new clinical evidence in there, nor should there be, should there be in a book. That's not an outlet for peer-reviewed clinical evidence. Now the fifth cited article, five out of five, looked a little more promising. It was a head-to-head -head competition between um, homeopathic treatments, a homeopathic treatment and a conventional treatment for vertigo. And the results showed no difference between them. So subjects in both of these treatment conditions saw gradual improvements 
in their symptoms for, of vertigo over the six weeks of the study. The homeopathic treatment seemed to work just as well as the conventional one. But there are several red flags, and I'm going to note a, a couple of these. First, it's unusual to set up an experiment where your only prediction is for there not to be any difference between two treatment conditions. True, there may be no difference because they're equally effective, but it can also be because data in one or both of the conditions are too scattered. The variances are too high. So statistically, there would be no difference between the conditions. And you can also find no difference between two conditions because the treatment is equally ineffective in those tr two treatments. So both of these could have been easily resolved, those questions, if there had been a placebo control group. Remember the author said these were 150 placebo controlled studies. No, not this one. Uh, there was no control group that would have really told us if one or both, either or neither of the uh, treatments were effective. Also, uh, the worst cases, the, the most extreme and chronic cases were excluded from the sample and it wasn't clear why. So I actually talked to an ENT I know about uh, vertigo and he did not treat, he did not treat vertigo with the, with the uh, medication that was uh, cited in this article. Uh, in fact, um, he said that vertigo tends to get better on its own over time. Uh, such as a six week period. And it is entirely possible that the effects of the conventional treatment were pretty weak anyway, because vertigo gets better on its own and because this treatment, uh, like most vertigo treatments is kind of hit or miss. So in the end, this is really just another inconclusive study. And I think it's also fair to say that the author of the review article completely misrepresented all five of these cited works and maybe even say that she lied about them. Um, none of them provide anything remotely close to the quality of support that she claimed. Uh, I didn't see anything else in that article. There were, there were more deceptions, uh, more deceptive claims. I ultimately just gave up. Uh, I told Jane what I'd found and in the end, she was unconvinced that uh, there was anything wrong with homeopathy. Uh, maybe that's appropriate since I didn't review the whole field. I just looked at the articles within the review article that she said convinced her. But uh, she clung to the anecdotal evidence uh, of a couple of cases that she said uh, it, it appeared that homeopathy was very effective. So uh, returning to the balance theory, this is where we started. I couldn't in good conscience flip to a positive attitude toward naturopathic medicine, uh, but the theory predicted that at least one of the attitudes in this situation is gonna change to restore balance. And this is what happened. Uh, Jane started not liking me very much, it seemed, or at least she was getting angry at me for things that just didn't really seem fair. Now the situation was balanced for her. She was uh, feeling more negative towards somebody who felt negative toward naturopathic medicine, an even number of negative signs. But the relationship between Jane and myself now is an unbalanced two cycle, which is very potent in the theory. And ultimately I just kind of had to let go. And with this being all that's left uh, in the relationships in this situation, Ultimately, it just kind of dissolved. Oh, and I forgot I put that sound effect in there. Um, and we parted ways, and that was the end of that little saga. So again, that doesn't disprove naturopathic medicine. It doesn't disprove homeopathy. Those are much bigger projects, but it did kind of reinforce my initially uh, negative orientation toward it. So. Moving on to part two, what is, what, what is astonishing? What do I mean by astonishing? In general, from, um, in science, I should say, not in general, uh, a, an astonishing claim is one that if it were true, would violate physical laws or documented precedent. 
And this is also a good definition for paranormal, which was in the title of a course that I, I taught for a long time. So for instance, uh, gravitational laws would be violated by reliable and valid evidence of a flying devil child or by reliable and valid evidence of a Bigfoot. Now, Bigfoot's existence wouldn't necessarily violate physical laws unless Bigfoot were psychic or could fly around or something, uh, but there's no reliable and valid precedent for Bigfoot, Bigfoots, big feet. So I'm kind of, uh, I'm there with Isaac Asimov as far as when to believe uh, something. Skeptics are frequently labeled as closed-minded, but I don't think this is closed-minded at all. I'll believe anything, no matter how wild and ridiculous, if there's evidence for it. The evidence has to be of a certain kind, however. Uh, we know in science what constitutes firmer and more solid evidence, and the more important the claim, the firmer and more solid the evidence should have to be. So what do I mean by evidence? In everyday parlance, evidence is simply information appearing to support or refute a claim. Scientific evidence has a higher standard that requires reliable and valid observations supporting or refuting a claim. Reliable meaning the, the observations are repeatable, valid meaning that the observations accurately reflect the thing that you're trying to measure or observe. The problem is that humans tend to misjudge things. We need scientific methods because our abilities to perceive and process information has serious limitations. We misjudge things far more than we realize. Sometimes we can't even distinguish reality from illusion. All of our senses can generate illusory perceptions. Sometimes what appears astonishing is really just an illusion. Cognitive biases also warp our judgments and lead us to believe things that are patently untrue. Maybe the simplest example is mistaking coincidence for causation. And maybe the most common is confirmation bias, where we, we deny or downplay evidence that seems to disagree with our preconceived notions. Logical fallacies at least deserve some mention here. There are many kinds that come into play when we form beliefs and when someone is trying to persuade some other people about, or, or that something astonishing has occurred. There are often logical fallacies involved. I'm not gonna talk about that today, but they can be really interesting and, and entertaining in their own right. So I'm gonna talk about uh, sensory illusions first and I'll play a little video for you here. Okay, I'll stop the video. No, I can't stop it. Uh, some of you may recognize this. This is actually a still image. It's demonstrating illusory motion. The fact that our brains interpret these images as moving, even though there's no actual motion taking place, already says a lot about our potential for misjudgment. You can demonstrate for yourself that it's a still image just by focusing on different parts of it, and you'll see that they stop when you look, at, when you look directly at them, but everything around them can, seems to keep moving. So it's a pretty amazing optical illusion. Uh, next, an auditory illusion. This is a, a really simple illusion, but very powerful. Our brains are pretty good at filling in gaps, like in this audio clip. The state governors met with their respective legislatures convening in the capital city. But now listen to it with the cough removed. The state governors met with their respective legislatures convening in the capital city. There's literally a full syllable missing, but with the cough, people tend to hear the entire word. The state governors met with their respective legislatures convening in the capital city. This illusion is known as temporal induction. Your brain fills in information to make sense of the world. An alternate label for temporal induction in this case might be uh, expectancy effect. We, we hear what we expect to hear, even if it isn't actually there. I wanted to uh, illustrate a cognitive bias next. Uh, I'm gonna use a little part of a study that I published years ago 
there are two groups that participated. It's a little survey experiment uh, with subjects in each group receiving a single question, nearly identical, but for something called an anchor. This was the high anchor group and the question that they saw, how many counties would you estimate there are in the state of Iowa? In a state that size, obviously there are fewer than 500. I've highlighted the anchor for you, but not for them. If you had to venture a guess, how many would you say? How many counties would you say there are? The low anchor condition looks identical except for a different number being shown. Instead of that number being fewer than 500, it's, it's uh, presented as more than five. So there is a theory predicting what the difference in the estimates will be across these two groups. Um, I'm not gonna go into that, but it's a pretty extraordinarily powerful effect. Uh, the only difference being that anchor information, which in both cases, in both conditions, subjects were told that it's irrelevant, that 500 is wrong or five is wrong. It's a number less than or greater uh, respectively than those numbers. So people uh, not only use that anchoring information, but when they're asked, did you use the, 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 that number that was given for you? Virtually everybody says either, no, I didn't use it, or no, I don't think so. So they're not even aware of this massive extent to which their uh, judgments are being biased. So there are some very general conditions under which we expect misjudgments to occur. Uh, Un unfamiliar or ambiguous circumstances. Now, relating this to the pandemic, just the emergence of a pandemic is pretty unfamiliar and ambiguous. Extraneous or distracting information, having rumors or politics in the air, uh, certainly clouds our understanding of what's going on. Heightened emotions, so fears of financial ruin, death, or uh, the collapse of society may uh, render our judgments biased. And of course, social influences as well, having authorities proclaim things about the pandemic who may actually themselves be misinformed or simply unqualified, uh, or having people close to us or having numerous people uh, tell us things about the pandemic. So the uh, opportunities for misjudgment are ripe in these unfamiliar circumstances. Now, why, why to believe this is something I could talk about for a, a semester, and I pretty much do. So it's a terribly brief overview of some of the factors that influence our belief, psych, uh, our beliefs in various uh, astonishing claims in particular. Psychological factors, of course, um, beliefs feel like they're generated in our own mind, even if uh, they're not. And so this, uh, this is only part of the story. Physiological factors are perceptual limitations feed heavily into the beliefs that we form and the judgments that we make on behalf of those beliefs. Social psychological factors, like I just mentioned, we're influenced by other people insofar as what we believe, and that may lead us astray as well. And sociological and anthropological factors can help explain broader social and cultural mechanisms that uh, originate uh, beliefs and help to sustain beliefs and belief systems over time. So just, uh, there are many popular astonishing beliefs, beliefs that actually have been investigated. These are some of the most popular uh, paranormal claims, if you will. Uh, and these have all been pretty thoroughly investigated and uh, the, the evidence for not one of them is very convincing, I should say. Um, so this is just a tiny, tiny selection. I talked about uh, one corner of alternative medicine, but in the next section, my final section, I'm gonna talk about a haunting. And you'll see why I chose this image and this title in just a minute. So last fall, I was contacted by a documentary filmmaker 
And he was commissioned to make a film about some weird goings on in a vape shop in central South Carolina. And he wanted to incorporate a skeptical perspective. The shop owner had shared some surveillance videos with the filmmaker who then shared them with me. And I also got to interview the shop owner by phone uh, for over an hour. Uh, after that, he shared some more audio and video materials with me. And I learned so much from my little investigation that I, de I decided to write it up and try to get it published. And first place I sent it was Skeptic Magazine and they published it. Uh, it appeared in the June issue from this year. And if you want a copy, PDF copy, just send me a request, email it, message me, however you want. The, uh, uh, I should mention that the appendix of the article lists the video clips that I'm going to show you as well. So those are actually on the web for you to uh, look at for yourself. So basically, the vape shop owner had made five astonishing claims. Uh, I looked into them all, and they were all made to appear very dramatic in the documentary with the shop owner and various so-called experts, like local ghost hunting groups, uh, all talking about how there's no earthly explanation for what they saw and what they felt. So I'm going to look at them one at a time. Watch carefully uh, up in this corner, if you can see my cursor moving. There are some yellow bottles, and they're sitting on a shelf. And some little jars right next to those are going to fly off the shelf. And then you'll see I, I've edited this so it repeats the crucial moment a second time. All right, so the jars didn't literally fly off the shelf. They seemed to get knocked off the shelf. And when I zoomed in on that part of the video, uh, that upper right-hand corner, it's actually pretty easy to see that the entire shelf jerked downward, maybe a quarter of an inch. Most likely the bracket holding the shelf wasn't fully set and the weight of the bottles uh, just caused it to, the whole shelf to click into place. And meanwhile, it was packed with bottles that rammed into each other when the shelf jerked. And that caused a chain reaction and it bumped several bottles in the front row right off the front of the shelf. Now, am I 100% certain that's what happened? No, maybe 95%, but uh, my scenario is consistent with what we can plainly see in the video and it doesn't invoke any unknown forces. So it seems to be a more likely explanation. Sorry, I gotta run this through to get to the next slide. Spirit orbs captured on video are all the rage among ghost hunters. There are little balls of light floating about the room and they're especially prevalent under infrared lighting which is what we have here. They have lots of orb videos uh, from, from the vape shop. I could spend an hour just on this topic, but suffice it to say that the little zipping balls of light are probably not spirits flying around the room, but dust particles that are just inches from the camera's lens. They waft in the little breezes and convection currents found in any indoor space, and they visually bloom when they reflect, when they reflect infrared light back into the sensitive camera lens. And you can recreate this very easily. The recreations don't look any different from what you see here, but somehow the spirit orb myth keeps persisting, maybe thanks mostly to uh, ghost hunting TV shows. In this uh, particular video, there's this illusion that they're coming in through the door. Uh, I looked at that really carefully and you could still see the ball of light uh, moving across the white door from right to left before it becomes very apparent in front of the dark background to the left of the door. So again, that if it truly came in the door, that would disprove that it's a, a bit of dust in front of the camera lens, uh, but it doesn't. It just 
it's just a piece of dust. Now, a, a slightly more serious investigator than the vape shop owner could have uh, ruled out the dust explanation by using two cameras. If the ball of light is out there in the room, both cameras would see it. If it's just a dust particle very close to the camera lens, only one camera would show it. And that study has actually been done and that's exactly what happened. All right, uh, this is one of several clips I got that claims uh, electronic voice phenomena, EVPs. And you'll hear one of the two guys in the video try to summon a spirit by saying, can you finish this? And then he does the old shave and haircut cadence knocking on the wall, hoping for that uh, two knock response. Instead, the listener is told that three words are spoken or whispered by a spirit. And I edited the audio, audio track only to the extent of maximizing the volume when we get to that crucial part. So you'll hear, you'll hear the static increase because the volume has increased. And then we'll, the clip will repeat uh, those sounds again a second time. So listen carefully. I think I've got my volume all the way up here. Can you finish this? So yeah, there's a little bit of something there above the static. If this were a ghost hunting TV show, we'd be told exactly what to hear. The expectancy effect would kick in and we'd probably hear it. But just approaching this without the benefit of expectancy effects, there really isn't anything discernible. And different people listening to that would probably hear different words or different sounds, if anything at all. Uh, even if it was a voice though, there's no way to rule out that one of the guys in the room or in another room whispered something under their breath. And in general, no effort was made in any of the clips I saw to put any kind of audio controls in place for any of the audio tracks. There were no attempts to triangulate the sources of the sounds to ensure that the sounds were coming uh, or not coming in from the outside. The, the, the business is exposed, uh, the entire roof is exposed and three of the four walls are exposed to the outside uh, or from the neighboring unit for that matter. So again, I'm not willing to leap to the conclusion that this EVP or the others that I heard came from some disembodied spirit uh, <laughs> responding to a knock-knock joke. Now, wisps are the elongated cousins of spirit orbs. Here's the best example from all the videos I saw. And we'll repeat that. Ben Radford uh, has published books on ghost hunting and paranormal investigations from a skeptical scientific perspective. And he was kind enough to give me some feedback on a draft of my skeptic article and weighed in on, on the wisps, which I wasn't really quite sure what they might be. Uh, he says they can be caused by water vapor or smoke or by a cobweb moving in front of the camera or other mundane things drifting across the camera lens. And indeed, if you take a close look at this video, you see that the wisp does move in front of uh, that chair near the bottom center uh, of, the, uh, of the image. Uh, so it was quite close to the camera. Again, there's no good reason to conclude that a wisp, uh, a little contrasting bit of uh, black and white is a spirit, uh, a, a dead person, a disembodied soul. Uh, and also remember that this is a vape shop. There are other videos that the owner shared with me uh, that showed people vaping in this very room. So maybe vape smoke is involved. You'd certainly want to rule that out and, and try to control the environment a little better. Now, the last clip I'll show you, I didn't see this until after the documentary was completed. Uh, so watch the book on the corner of the desk.
right? That's pretty spooky, right? Uh, and this video is different from all the others. All the others were things that could have happened without being purposely set up. This book was not moved by gravity or by a puff of convection current. So either an unknown form of energy moved it, such as whatever kind of unknown energy ghosts are made of, or it was set up as a hoax. Uh, if it was a hoax, it wasn't particularly elaborate. And I took on the challenge of recreating it in my kitchen, actually in the very place I'm sitting right now. I have no experience as an illusionist or as a videographer or even as a ghost hunter for that matter, but I was able to reproduce this effect alone in my kitchen in under an hour, including doing three or four takes uh, in order to really get it right. Plus I captured it in, in regular room lighting on an iPhone camera, so it's much clearer than the surveillance video. Here it is. Oh, and sorry, please forgive the uh, expletive. Um, it was really scary. Yeah. All right, well, that, uh, that was Diana Krall's rendition of I Don't Stand a Ghost of a Chance with You playing in the background. Um, this is what it looked like behind the scenes. Instead of smoke and mirrors, I used uh, string and duct tape uh, inside a dictionary. And I wrapped the string around the kitchen island to where I was sitting and I just tugged on the string at the appropriate times with my right hand, which was not within the camera frame. So um, I was, uh, this wasn't totally fun to do. Uh, to this point, as I said, the shop owner uh, didn't show anything in his videos that couldn't have just happened on its own. I thought maybe he was just a little naive about the orbs and the wisps and the EVPs. But in this case, he, he denied it when I asked him point blank, uh, but it does appear that something was purposely set up with the intent of deceiving viewers. And again, it could have been a ghost, I suppose, but uh, this explanation that something like this setup was used seems a bit more likely and it doesn't violate any physical laws. So again, the, the evidence that was presented to me doesn't really rise to a level that would convince me that physical laws were being violated by disembodied spirits that could interact with physical objects. So I'm uh, getting near the end of the presentation. I, I wanna give you a few thoughts before uh, I finish up just to leave you with. Uh, some a few words about healthy skepticism. What are its what are its properties? It's healthy to be open minded, but as the expression goes, don't be so open minded that your brains fall out. To think critically, you need to do some background research on any given astonishing claim. You'll also need to seek out the skeptical arguments and the alternative explanations for these phenomena. And usually, they're a lot harder to find than the the original claim. Uh, I recently spoke and in fact interviewed again, the vape shop owner. He knows that I'm very skeptical, but I've treated him with honesty and respect throughout the whole process, just as I did Jane actually. Uh, and I earned his trust. Recently, he offered me the keys to his shop and permission to investigate it in person on my own anytime I want. We have to approach the inexplicable with some humility. Uh, recognizing that what seems miraculous may only appear so because we lack cru crucial evidence or crucial knowledge. I consulted with at least four people with more expertise than I had on audio art artifacts, on video artifacts, on wisps and ghost hunting methods. And if this had been a full-blown investigation, I'd have spoken with even more. 
So for me, finding alternative explanations for the astonishing doesn't take the wonder and mystery out of life. Uh, I find it absolutely fascinating how various factors can combine to, to generate and reinforce paranormal beliefs. But I still have the same sorts of joyful and spiritual feelings that others have. Mine tend to be associated with love, music, art, science, and other human endeavors. And to those who may be pity skeptics, trust me, we have rich emotional lives, same as you. Finally, I'm often asked questions like, what if there's really something to it? Or, let's say astrology. What, what if there's something about astrology that you're missing out on? Or more bluntly, what if you're wrong? Well, I'm with Asimov. If better evidence arrives and I'm wrong, I'll modify my beliefs. My, my self-identity may be invested in scientific, rational approaches to understanding the material world, but my self-identity is not invested in any particular claim being right or wrong. Then I'd turn the question around. Dear believer, uh, you're hitching your wagon to a claim that violates extremely well-supported physical laws, and that can be explained in other ways that violate no physical laws. So what if you're wrong? What if you've been basing important decisions on the supposed insights of your astrologer or psychic, but they're only using well-known deceptions to convince you that they have powers they don't actually have? Are you willing to modify your beliefs? And I see that um, I've gone over a couple of minutes, so I'm not going to uh, go through these details. We can discuss this more if you want uh, as, I, as I finish this. Uh, the suggestions are to be okay, not knowing for sure whether something is true or not. Share what you learn with other people. And there is a moral issue here that has to do with what do you do when you see other people being misled uh, and potentially to their own harm. So again, we can, we can save that for a discussion after. And that takes us to the end. So thanks for everybody who hung in there. Uh, I'm going to stop screen sharing and rejoin the group. There we go. Great. Thank you so much for your talk. Yeah. That was really interesting stuff. And it looks like we've got a um, few questions coming through. So we'll start off with them. And I did take those, um, those homeopathy, homeopathy uh, pills growing up. Didn't really do anything for me. So yeah, hydrated you probably. Yeah. Oh, there oh, you, you took go. The pills. You took the pills, sorry. Yeah. Um, we had like the big case of them and all that stuff. <laughs> I think <laughs> they might still be in a closet somewhere. Okay. Anyway, so Andrew, I'm going to butcher your last name. I apologize. Cedar all. Cedar all. Um, hey, Andrew. <laughs> For the Q&A, do you think the rise of predatory publishers makes it more difficult for the public to evaluate certain grandiose claims purportedly proven by peer-reviewed and published studies? How can the common public better learn how to evaluate claims that are presumably backed by such evidence? So it's a two-part question. Yeah, that's a great question, Andrew. Uh, I think this takes some uh, some research. There are certainly sources that are uh, better reputed than other sources. It pays to get to know those. Um, it's not a question of just finding information that supports uh, what you believe, but trying to find good sources, or at least trying to find both sides of an issue represented by multiple sources. Uh, I would imagine if it hasn't happened already, that some sort of information clearinghouses are going to emerge that, uh, I mean, we do have uh, uh, websites like QuackWatch, uh, quackwatch.com for medical information. Uh, we have snopes.com, which seems to be pretty unbiased, but as far as uh, going to original articles, that's tough because I get, Almost every day I get a request to submit something for publication to a fly-by-night journal. This is done all the time. Uh, people who are just desperate for, for publications will submit to these journals, get their work published, and then say, aha, it's peer-reviewed. 
Uh, so yeah, this is a real problem. I can't solve it by myself. <laughs> I don't know the solution to it, but I would imagine that starting with more reputable sources is going to is going to help, especially with medical uh, medical information. There are some good sources like WebMD and uh, Medline that that I use. Great, thank you. Um, next one is a comment question um, from Rusty, I believe. Uh, in my view, naturopathic medicine takes advantage of one, our need for cures, and two, cures are hard to come by. New drug discovery is a long process with very low hit rate. Any comments? Yeah, there's a, I don't know if, it, it's, if it's a main phenomenon in social psychology, but wishful thinking effect, or maybe this is the expectancy effect, uh, but it's certainly related to the placebo effect. And I didn't point this out when I quickly went through the image of that over-the-counter homeopathic remedy. Uh, that was actually from public supermarket. And right on the label, it says, uh, does not interact with other drugs, uh, won't cause drowsiness. Uh, I mean, there are a lot of th positive things you can say about a medication that does absolutely nothing. Uh, and I, I think that this, this all feeds into uh, a placebo effect for cases where it does work or seem to work, I should say. I'm going through the comments myself too. Yeah. Okay, uh, pre-reading. So Allison Bianchi uh, said, my students read your chapter on what theory isn't from the 1994 <laughs> group processes book. In that chapter, you mentioned that paranormal activity is scientifically observable because it's not a repeatable. The students very often push back on that. I then ask them to bring in evidence of repeatable paranormal activity that can't be debunked, which of course they can't, but they're still skeptical of this idea. Any thoughts for more ways to convince these individuals? Will they ever be convinced? Sorry, Barry, I meant to say scientifically unobservable. Sorry, yeah. I typed that a little fast, but they're like, oh no, Dr. Bianchi, this is repeatable, but ghosts come and go, whatever. And I'm like, okay, bring in the evidence. And of course they never do, but they still believe. Like it's still, I, I, I can't shake them of that. And and in some, I guess in some ways you're offending them because you're like pushing against their beliefs. I don't know. Of course. Uh, yeah, that pretty much like my balance diagram with, with Jane, the naturopath, um, it was pretty offensive to her that I not only disagreed, but I kind of threw her evidence back at her and, and showed how flawed it was. But my favorite um, test of a paranormal claim was Sean um, Carlson's article in Nature, uh, the Nature Journal, uh, top, generally, generally regarded as the top science journal in the world. And he did a double blind test of astrology. And he designed the test with the help of astrologers from quote unquote, reputable astrological organizations. In other words, he let them in on the design of the study and set the criteria for success along with them. And it just utterly debunked uh, astrology and, and what these astrologers claim they would be able to do. Uh, and that in, in that study, it involved having uh, their subjects choose their own, uh, what's it called, uh, a chart uh, from a, a group of three charts. It turned out they were able to do that at about 33%. And then for the astrologers to uh, choose the correct chart for the different subjects based on a, the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory, the MMPI, which they claimed they could do, but again, they did so uh, only at chance levels. So, I mean, it, it's, it's a little bit technical in that article, but certainly not, I mean, I used it in undergraduate courses all the time just by summarizing it for the students. So I don't know if that would convince them or not, because then you could always say, well, yeah, I, well, I, I gave a talk once where I, I pretty much debunked uh, water witching or dousing right in front of a group. And a, a guy came up to me afterwards. He said, oh, that was awesome. But you know, aliens are visiting uh, New Mexico. <laughs> so you can debunk one thing, but 
um, you won't necessarily convince people of other things by doing so. Great. That's all I have on, on my list of questions. <laughs> well, any... we'll, uh, we'll open up the floor. Um, under your reactions tab, you can raise your hand or go ahead and unmute yourself if you got another question. We'll kind of open up the floor a bit. How many people are here, by the way? We've got a total of 42. And I think we were kind of hovering around there. So oh. not including the hosts around 38. I can't fit them all on my screen. Yeah, it's a good problem to have. Uh, let's see, we got Charles Lanahan. Oh, hey, uh, my question is, have you ever um, ex have you ever been skeptical of something going into something and then learn more about it and become unskeptical of it? Any kind of uh, extraordinary phenomena or, or event? I, I can't say that I have, you know, I. I once spent a, a couple of days with the parapsychologists at the what used to be the Rhine Laboratory at Duke University and then moved moved off to, to be its own entity or was kicked off, I'm not sure. And I'll tell you that being immersed in their world for a couple of days, that was the most convinced or the most I had moved toward being convinced that weird things have been in, in fact uh, demonstrated experimentally and under very strict controls and with all the appropriate statistics. It really wasn't until after I left and took a closer look at the methods that were used, at the statistics that were used and gotten input from other uh, psychologists who had, um, who had reviewed the work as well that I started to see possible chinks in the armor. Now, I wouldn't say that I was convinced that uh, the various kinds of ESP that they were claiming exist. I wasn't convinced that they were true, but I felt like I was ready to be convinced at that point. Uh, it did loosen up my, my skepticism. Uh, it was relatively short-lived, I have to say, but that's, that's probably the closest I came. Uh, most other, I mean, that, and, and in a way that makes some sense because of all the paranormal paranormalists, uh, that, I, that I've encountered in all the research that I've done, they are the ones who, the parapsychologists are the ones who are most serious about scientific methods, about using advanced uh, and appropriate statistical methods. And they were really impressive. In general, they're better trained and conduct tighter experiments than anybody in psychology or sociology. It is 19 o'clock. That, that I knew. So um, yeah, it was impressive, but not totally convincing in the end. Good question, thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, looks like we've got some other hands up. Um, I think I saw Bob Levy unmute himself. So we'll go with Bob. Hi, Bob. There's a chat message. Bob's a lawyer and he's gonna argue something, I know. <laughs> I, I have it in the uh, chat box. I can read it if you want. He's, he's muttering to himself. Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll read it out from the chat box, thank you. Um, recently, there seems to have been a correlation between skepticism and politics. Example, vaccines and climate change. Are those two examples outliers or evidence of an ex explicable relationship? And if explicable, does causation go from politics to skepticism or vice versa? Yeah, an, another great question. Uh, there's been all kinds of research done on what properties or traits or characteristics of people seem to make them more vulnerable to accepting uh, paranormal claims, supernatural claims, false claims in general. And now education is one of them, uh, but it's not always consistent. Religious belief is a pretty big one in some cases, but not in others. It's uh, oh, authoritarian uh, personalities, uh, another factor that sometimes is correlated with paranormal beliefs. But I, I'm sorry to say, Bob, that there's no like magic explanatory bullet for this. Uh, it's, it's easy to, uh, <laughs> I mean, I could make the same judgment errors that I was talking about and say, yeah, Republicans aren't as well educated or 
um, or are more superstitious in general um, for this reason or that reason, it wouldn't be true. Um, it, or at least the, the, any correlation would be way too small to actually explain these kinds of differences. So I would look more toward research on persuasion um, and why those particular beliefs got associated with different political parties. There's probably a historical uh, trail that you could follow to determine that. I think it may be pretty arbitrary because uh, as we've seen, as, as, as you yourself, Bob, like to point out, there are wackos at the extremes of both the conservative and the liberal uh, uh, camps. And yeah, I, 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 so I can't, I can't explain it. Um, and I certainly don't know which way the, cause, the causal arrow goes between politics and skepticism. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, let's see, we'll try and do this in order. Uh, we'll do ZB and then we'll go back to Rusty and then we'll finish it off with uh, Andrew's last question. So uh, ZB. Thank you. Hi, Barry. It's Zoe. I I'm Hi, curious. I actually have two questions. And the first one is, what purpose do beliefs in incredible claims serve? So for example, might a belief in astrology allow a person to identify characteristics in themselves that they want to foster? And, and that's just an example. And then the follow-up question to that is, is there a correlation between the lack of clear negative consequences that are immediate and the uh, and the likelihood of believing in, in strange claims. Um, so again, that correlation between the lack of clear negative consequences immediately, and then the strange belief, and what purpose do some incredible claims serve? Thank you. I think there may be a, a common thread or a common answer that that addresses both both of those threads. And it has, I don't know, there's been some research on this, uh, the extent to which these kinds of beliefs uh, are comforting, uh, reduce stress, help provide a sense of understanding and control in situations that otherwise might seem uh, chaotic and scary. Um, so stress reduction, it's a little bit too pat as a, as a, as a you know, a major explanation for why people believe. Uh, we also believe, uh, and to say that there, there's a purpose, well, there, there isn't necessarily a purpose to, to holding false beliefs. There are reasons, certainly. Uh, yeah, I, I, so I, the second, I'm not sure I understood the, the second part though about consequences. The, the second one is this, right? If uh, you believe, for example, that you can fly, let's assume that you are convinced you have the power to fly, right? It's very easy to have that belief if you're sitting down in your living room in a nice comfortable chair. It is not as easy to stand at the door of an airplane that's open and say, okay, you believe in that jump. Now, all of a sudden, there's an immediate consequence, right? And the consequence is, is potentially lethal in this particular case, or likely lethal, lethal, right? So I'm just wondering if there is a correlation between the lack of clear, immediate negative consequence. So if we take, for example, the vaccine, right? The vaccine is, you're not taking the vaccine, but you're not going to die in the next five minutes, right? But you may die in the next five months or the next five weeks, that's possible, but it's not immediate. So I just wonder if there is that correlation between the lack of a clear negative immediate consequence and strange beliefs. Yeah, I, so I, I think about this in a, a kind of a complex way. I think that there is a range of types of people and so far as how, what it takes to convince them of something, that something is true or that it's not true. And I think for some people, uh, there are some simple tests that are convinced that are, will be convincing to them, or some uh, simple consequences that will that they will find convincing. That when they think when they really think back about their precognitive dreams, they really didn't come true most of the time. That sort of thing. Uh, but for other people, as we have seen over and over again recently, no amount of contradictory evidence, no amount of negative consequence. Uh, will change their mind because you could always come up, you can always connect the dots in a different way, right? And come up with an explanation that 
uh, that re uh, makes sense uh, makes sense of what was momentarily left unsensible, if that if that makes any sense. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I, we have people you know dying of COVID nineteen who are still saying it's a hoax and, and, and holding on to that belief by believing they just have something else or that it's just a serious case of the flu. Uh, so uh, yeah, I don't want to overgeneralize and, and say that people are of one type or another, that there really is a range of uh, convincibility, I guess you'd say. All right, thank you. Um, Rusty, you had a question? Uh, you, you mentioned uh, parapsychologists at Duke. Um, what about those in other in, in our government? Uh, there's been some talk that at one point the CIA was looking at something called remote viewing and, and other other uh, para, para science, if you will. Uh, yeah, uh, boy, I, I was doing a project where I was in, I was interviewing all of the top parapsychologists in the world by a consensus of the parapsychologists. I had about 20 of them in, in this sample and I went off and interviewed some and I had an assistant do some. And one of the guys that I interviewed was actually part of that project. He was, he was a psychologist who was funded by the CIA to do remote viewing research. And he was breathless about it. He, he, he was just absolutely convinced that uh, what he found was proof positive that this should be a funded program and we should have spies sitting sitting in offices in the Pentagon who are remote viewing uh, in places far away. Now, um, looking back at that research, uh, as of course many uh, well-informed skeptics have done, there are all kinds of holes in the remote viewing work. Uh, now, uh, I want to correct one thing that you said. It, they're not in the government, but they were funded by a government program. And many of many uh, alleged parapsychologists, uh, I'm sorry, many alleged subjects who had parapsychological abilities, allegedly, uh, were kind of sifted through this process. And a few came out at the end seeming to have extraordinary abilities. But whether that was a case of you know flipping uh, a coin a thousand times and finding a run of ten in a row heads. Uh, in other words, whether that was just a chance outcome or not, uh, I'm pretty sure that if they had demonstrated a truly repeatable, replicable ability, we'd know more about that, or it would be getting used. Um, and again, and if that were being used, I don't know how long that secret would be kept. The, the, the secret of the CIA research didn't last very long as it turned out. So yeah, it's, it's uh, it, it, you know, this is one area where nobody wishes more than me that it were true that uh, parapsychology was uh, a legitimate uh, or, or that psychic uh, phenomena were legitimate and that we, we could learn and use those skills but there just hasn't been the reliable evidence for it. Thank you. Great, and uh, I'm kind of gonna lump Andrew and Donnie's question together because they're kind of in the similar vein of uh, the magic bullet. Um, are there any methods that are pro most proven to debunk claims with political bent such that people are willing to change their minds? Is there any way to convince people of one political camp or another in that uh, another that a particular view is objectively incorrect? I'm thinking about claims regarding the most recent presidential election. It seems our current discourse is particularly irrational and not based on evidence, but tribalism. And Donnie said regarding the conversation around politics and belief, could there be persuasion or purposeful misinformation to persuade people to believe something? This is a really tough problem, obviously. Um, a, a psychology, I believe it's a psychologist, uh, published a book recently exactly on this topic, uh, exactly on how to change minds of people who have been so uh, embedded in some kind of false belief system. 
And he acknowledged, I, I can't remember his name. I can't remember the book, but I did hear him very recently on a podcast. Um, he acknowledges how incalcitrant these beliefs can be, how, how difficult it is to change minds. But he did recommend, uh, oh, this was Mitch West. That's right, Mitch West. Uh, and he, uh, he advocates just some, a, a series of fairly common sense things. Be nice to the people. Listen to what they have to say. Acknowledge their belief. Acknowledge their point of view. Um, be gentle in your criticism of it. So those are, the, those are the kinds of things that I remember he talked about. And maybe 98% of the time, it's not going to change any minds, unfortunately. Um, but this is, you know, this is the, this is the ocean we're swimming in right now, unfortunately. Great. Thanks for your answer on that. Appreciate it. Yeah, I wish I had a better one. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this, this talk has definitely given me a lot to chew on and I will be definitely revisiting it. So we are recording this. So for anybody who wants to revisit and, uh, watch it again. We have a YouTube channel, which I'll, I'll link here below in the chat box. And it's also linked on our meetup page. So you can head back there and find it and uh, re-listen to this whole talk and all the questions, which have been excellent. So thank you all to asking great questions. And um, yeah, I want to thank Barry again for being so open to answering these questions and giving us a talk. I mean, there's so much room to do more, I can see how you could spend an entire semester on just one slide. It's, it's really great stuff. Um, yeah, so big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. I'm happy to come back sometime if you want. Uh, Absolutely. On these subjects, so it's, yeah. it's been fun for me to prepare this. Yeah, we'll be in touch. Absolutely. All right, thanks a lot. Great. Sh oh, should I hang around here in case people want to chat or? Um, I think we'll, we'll go ahead and close it off. Okay. Yeah. Thanks right. everybody. Thanks. Thank you, Barry. Bye everyone. Take care. Thank you.